the thing, the whole evolution narrative is the most, it's just so hilarious because the evolution narrative has to be, ends up being teleological. I mean, they can't avoid it. Every time they try to make it non-teleological, it fails. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And so it always ends up having to be teleological. And so it, then, it, then it becomes non-scientific immediately. It just right. becomes a kind of a mythological pattern. And yeah. it's like, well, if it's just a mythological story, my mythological story is much better. Like the, the <laughs> creation narrative in Genesis uh, accounts way in a better manner for the ontological hierarchy of, of, the, of your experience of the world than the way that, that, that evolution talks about reality. And it's, and you can see like, I mean, you know, when I talked about Weinstein, it's always the same issue. And you, you see the same with all the evolutionary theorists. They're basically saying what evolutionary want evolution really wants you to do is to basically kill and compete and take and, right. and, and just get your seed out there get your genes to the next generation. But of course we shouldn't do that. Right. It's like, okay, well, where do you get the, we shouldn't do that from? Yeah. Right. That's actually what interests me because that's, that's a lot closer to what I care about. And then maybe you can find that in the Genesis story, but the other, you can't find it anywhere else in your little yeah. pattern, like in yeah. your little worldview. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. So I have uh, a couple of special guests with me today on Grill Country. I have uh, Michael Martin, who's kind of a regular and a friend of the channel. Um, Dr. Michael Martin, you can find on his own podcast these days, Regeneration Podcast, where he has very interesting guests and uh, a guest who will need no introduction for most of my audience, <laughs> uh, Jonathan Pajot of The Symbolic World. That's great. Um, it's great to finally meet both of you in person. Yeah. I've had contacts with Michael for a long time. Really? Just at least 10 contacts. years, I bet. Exactly. Yeah. I sent in a piece of art for his magazine once, and we yep. met through a common common friend. And so it's great to see you in person. Yeah, it is nice. <laughs> so, well, that's great to learn about I feel about like I've known you for a long time, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it feels like, too, but we've yeah. never actually spoken. So, yeah. yeah, that's actually, that's very interesting because, um, like, when I first started reading Michael's books, it's like, that's immediately, it's like, oh, I need, I need to have him talk to Peugeot at some point, somehow. That's got to happen. It's like, they've got to talk. So here we are. So yeah. I might do more listening than talking today because I'm excited <laughs> to hear the two of you talk. So um, I just kind of dive in like one thing that we can like kind of the thing we're going to talk about today is kind of like Christian esotericism, mysticism, that kind of thing. And I and we've been doing this series on um, Tolberg's meditation of the Tarot on the Tarot on Grail Country. Um, Michael has um, has taught the book and read it several times. And he's been a guest on some of our episodes and you've started reading it recently too. So I thought we could just like maybe dive into that and tell us about what your impressions have been of the book so far. Um, I really, I think it's wonderful. There are obviously a few caveats. I was really surprised about the reincarnation bit. I was like, really? (laughs) That's that's a little surprising. And I know where he gets it. I mean, obviously he's a Kabbalist, so he gets it from the whole cycle of souls thing. That's probably where, why he's he's because he, he, a lot of his stuff seems to to refer to to a Kab- to Kabbalah. So, um, but besides that, I think his cosmic vision is very much aligned with mine and the way that he understands what he calls vertical causality. He's also adding some vocabulary for me that I'll be able to use, I think, in the future because it's definitely connected directly to you know. And I th- I think the richness of the book is also that, I mean, this is what we'll get into later, probably in our discussion, even with you, Michael, is that I think one of the reasons why I've bifurcated from kind of Christian esotericism and, and kind of stepped back from it is that I, I felt like the way that it was presenting itself to me, especially in the recent, let's say in the last, I mean, I guess more like at least 100 years has been almost as a challenge to Christianity and has been yeah. presented almost as something which was which was subversive to Christianity. And I think that when reading Tom Bird's book, I think that he's really trying to reconcile, you know, the the, the esoteric traditions in the West with, you know, real, uh, real Christianity. And and uh, and so I, I was really appreciative of that. Yeah, in a lot of ways, it seems like what he's doing is almost it's almost a plea with esotericists to cooperate with the church. It's kind of the tone of like a lot of the book. Definitely. I mean, I haven't I've read about maybe a third of the books. So I'm not I'm not right. I'm nowhere near from done, but. For sure, everything 
I'm seeing, like I said, except for the weird reincarnation, reincarnation thing, everything else I, I, I feel is he's really, I think that someone would read, if someone read that book and then watched my videos, they would immediately understand what I'm talking about. And probably vice versa. Like if people watch my videos and then read that book, they would, they would immediately understand. So that's great. Yeah. I think what, what, what Tom Berg's, what I think he's doing and it resonates with a lot of people is there's a kind of traditionalism to him. It's a kind of, uh, a, not only appreciation, but devotion to traditional sacramental forms of Christianity. I mean, he's, he's a Russian writing in French <laughs> about, about Western esotericism. And it's, and it's very different. You know, I, I don't know, maybe I don't know enough about it, but from what I know, uh, especially the East and especially in uh, Russia, the esoteric traditions, if you want to call them that there were actually borrowed from the West, yeah. well, from Yako Burma and even the Philadelphian society and people like that. And then it, then it can we, so start with the Protestants moved to the Russians came back, at least part of it came back to the West, but, yeah. but in the West, I mean, you know, Part of what I think Tom Berg's doing, part part a lot of what he draws on is not what I would even call like kind of a traditional. Uh, I I mean I kind of hesitate to use the word. Uh, well, you know, Christian hermeticism, the word he uses. Yeah. Uh, he he because his Christian hermeticism is is grounded more in the nineteenth century. And he when, when he quotes all these authors like Eliphaz Levy and Papua. Yeah, most of his sources seem to be like late, yeah. like nineteenth and early twentieth century. He has right, Peladan right. and yeah, and, uh, Pe uh, um, which were all. I mean, they're all interesting. And Peladan in particular is kind of fascinating to me. Um, but Tomber, I mean, I mean, so so my doctorate is in sixteenth and seventeenth century English or English literature, religious literature, where when hermeticism was hermeticism. So it's a very different, it's, it's very different, you know, that, that strain of hermeticism. So when people talk about Rosicrucianism or hermeticism and they think it's like being a Freemason and like, well, no, no, that's not these kind of, those, those kind of yeah, people conflate guys. The, well, those, well, the thing is what happened is after the 17th century, when there was a kind of a revi revival of that stuff and, and was connected to masonry in the 18th century, 19th century, um, they kind of just borrowed the, the vernacular and appropriated it. And it really doesn't have a lot to do with what this kind of, because uh, if you look at like traditional figures from the Hermetic uh, period in 17th century England, like Robert Flood and... Uh, Thomas and Henry Vaughn and Jakob Berm, they were, if you would have, if we would have talked to them in right now, they would have described themselves as kind of traditional Christians. Yeah. What they were rejecting was the scientific revolution and its base materialism. And we, which if you can do science without the, the realm of the spirit, they thought that was, that was crazy. Right. And so they, they were, they were kind of traditionalists. They were kind of old. Well, there's school. a way you're right. There's a way in which it seems like the Freemasons, they seem to have just, they basically just want to aggregate all the esotericism. They seemed at least at some moment, maybe not so much now, but at least in the, in the late, in the 19th century, they seem to want to just kind of pull everything into mm -hmm. their sphere. And so started using all this imagery from the different, the different esoteric traditions. And so that's why I think today, People also conflate it all together mm -hmm, and because exactly. of also the the strangeness of the the so you know the the, the luciferian hoax of uh, that happened with the mason that all got weirdly kind of brought into modern occultism and then mm -hmm. taken up by the satanists basically using the yep. the textiles host hoax as a as a template for their satanism it's just it's just so all of it just so weird that yeah it's also one of the reasons why I kind of tend to stay away. Yeah, no kidding. I would too, yeah. Stuff because it just like, it just, it's also hard for people to be able to differentiate. And I often, I often feel like I don't have to, like, I don't need it. You know, I, I, right. I, I think, I feel like I have in St. Gregory of Nyssa and in St. Maximus and in, you know, a, a, a good cosmic understanding of the liturgy. 
like I have everything I need. And, and if I'm going to pull from other sources, I can do it once in a while, but I tend not to do it too much because if I, if I would, if I do, then people get confused. That's my feeling at least. I understand. Mm -hmm. Now you ever, you ever read the book Foucault's pendulum? Yeah. That's a, that's a hilarious book. Yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I thought it's, I read it the whole thing as a giant, like kind of joke on it. It is. It, it is. Like, it's, 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 it's set up. It's like, it's like a 400 page setup to a joke, <laughs> you know, because what, what, what he does, because all the, the, the so-called occultists, you know, they, they get talked into thinking they're members of a, of an occult group they didn't know existed, but they're sure they're initiates into it. And yeah, they basically, he basically invents an esoteric uh, yeah. society, a, a <laughs> society. And then he, it's basically saying like, because it's the idea of the secret, because the idea of the secret is what rules a lot of these players. Then if we create another secret, it's, it's almost like creating a body to be, to, it's like a little vacuum for which people to kind of step into. Right. I mean, you have people today, like, all these people saying they're Rosicrucians, like you've had these Rosicrucian churches in Africa. There was a lot of them. Oh, yeah. These mm -hmm. called Rosicrucian churches. And you have all these and all these people who think they're Templars are the same with the Freemasons who think they're Templars and stuff. A lot of it, I feel, is is so fantastical that I, I tend to. Yeah, I tend. But I, I go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you're right. I mean, they're just appropriating ideas like that. I don't think there's any substance there. Yeah. You know. But see, Guénon, like René Guénon had, I don't know how serious it was, but with Papu, they had the idea of creating a kind of Christian esoteric thing using Freemasonry, the Martinism. Yeah. I think it still exists today. There are still there, Martinists today. And, there, and uh, Arthur Edward Waite was another one. I okay. Mean, mm. And there's some of those people in the occult revival of the late 19th and early 20th century. I mean, some of them, not everybody, but some of them tried to um, Christianize it or, or tried yeah, to. Yeah, Wade was a member of the Golden Dawn at the same time as Charles Williams. Yeah, and, but they both bailed on it, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, so, but I, but I think, you know, it's actually because uh, I, I was puzzling over this whole phenomenon since in anticipation of our talk and thinking about. You know, I, now I'm technically an Eastern Rite Catholic and Jonathan is Orthodox, so it's pretty much the same thing. Um, but there's no tradition like that, as far as I know, in, in those realms. I mean, they certainly picked the, the, the Russians, for instance, would pick up on Freemasonry and all that stuff after the fact. But there's no right. kind of there's no homegrown version, right? But I think it I think that the reason why we don't see a homegrown version is that we don't see what we could call the we don't see the split. Because one of the problems is that there's a there's a problem, there's a problem with high theory in the world of esotericism, which is that I think that when people start to create explicit systems and try to create things that are very, very um they're almost like these these uh, that are that are very explicit systems of, of, of causality and higher beings and all this mm -hmm. stuff. I think that that's one of the issues that happens in Western esotericism. There's almost like a split between popular uh, religion that is that becomes more sentimental and more morality based, and mm -hmm. then you have this thing that splits out and becomes very high minded and and intellectual and esoteric. Very intellectual, yeah. But I can find I can find everything in the icon of the Last Judgment that you could find in any esoteric system that that you could develop you know in the in the say that the layout of a church and the way that it's all set up all it's all there but it's not yeah. necessarily uh, it's not necessarily uh theorized right. is what the way that i would say it and i don't know if that I, makes sense no I, it does but the, the way where i was heading <clears throat> pardon me is uh so i'm preparing for i have to get this lecture in september on pavel florensky yeah the, the Russian sociologist and priest and martyr. And so I was reading some of his earlier articles. He was only in his early 20s. And a, a phrase that comes up at least twice, maybe more in, the, in those articles, is the salt has lost his, its savor. And he was concerned, and he's, I think he was already ordained by this point. He was concerned that, uh, that the 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 experience of Christianity in Russia at the time that for a lot of people, the, the salt had lost its savor. There was no flavor to it. And I think what I'm looking around now and I, I, I can imagine uh, 
what drew Tom Berg, for instance, I mean, because he grew up in Russia, um, or drew people like Arthur Edward Wade or whoever it happens to be toward that stuff is I think Blavatsky, there is some for goodness sake. well Blavatsky she's kind of yeah she's Russian too but she's yeah yeah what's what that's the why Russian? I mentioned her yeah but but my point is is that and in fact if you read the the notes of Bulgakov and uh Florensky and Florensky's book uh the pillar and the, the what's it called the the big one you know the pillar yeah the, yeah, yeah. is it pillar and ground of truth or something like yes that? the pillar and ground of truth yeah. Um, is that they were reading a lot of people like Rudolf Steiner and Leadbeater. They, I, I don't know if they were quote Blavatsky, but they do those other people mm. and or and John Portage and Jakob Burma. So they were t- and uh, they were definitely aware of that stuff. And I think the reason being, and what do you, let me hear what you guys think about this, is that like we see right now with a lot of kids who grow up or people, even adults who grew up in a Christian tradition and somehow the salt loses its savor for them. And they, and then they, whether they're, they're drawn to Buddhism or something else, very exotic, or I see a, a lot of kids being drawn toward neo-paganism for instance. Yeah. And, I th- and I'm, I'm wondering if this is the same kind of thing that Florensky was seeing in 1903 and that maybe was was impacting those people in the, the occult revival of the nineteenth century. That's that's a good that's a good theory. I think it's an interesting theory, and and I think it also could say you could say something like it connects to my own experience, which is that for me, my my I never stopped being a Christian. I always really stayed a Christian, but let's say there was a detour and then a return where it's like I was reading more exotic things and stranger things, and then I was able to then look back at you know, traditional Christianity and, and find in it, you know, the fullness that I, that I had been missing. But Mm -hmm. when I did though, I also left to the side, a lot of the weird stuff that, that I might've been interested because I felt like there was something about it, which was, like I said, there's something about it that was deincarnation, like that was like too high. And so it Mm -hmm. tended to suck. It tended to suck the world towards a a kind of a, it's a head trip. Yeah, it's exactly. Trip. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it and it and not. I think it's also because a lot of people I met they would they would tend to use esoteric ideas to relativize existence constantly to constantly relativize forms, and yep. so they're constantly criticizing any form and everything as if you know it's it's all about this high high and it's like Ein Sof as if it's like as if it's like Ein Sof will destroy the world. It's not supposed to be in the world, and so you have to be careful with even with non dualists. You see it all the time. When non-dualists are out of control, they tend to want to, they have this like weird pulsion inside them to destroy the world and to kind of relativize everything to the point that it, that, that it, it actually, and so I think that that's yeah. why I tend to come back and I think incarnational thinking, and that's why like to a certain extent, hermeticism has something I think possibly to offer. And interestingly enough, if, if according to the information that I have, like whatever remaining hermeticists that seem to still exist i mean they just do the jesus prayer now <laughs> like that's yeah. the, i think that well, maybe they think that that's all that's really left of what hermeticism and so they get together and they do the jesus prayer and right. they don't they're not initiating anybody else it's like the doors oh yeah <laughs> there's no one else I'm, coming in I'm they're the just initi- gonna die with the with whatever it is that they have let me initiate you i will be your master yeah yeah i, I have no i had no pay i was i my my uh, trajectory is kind of very similar to yours. And I got to the point, I was like, no, I'm not, how about I just bloom where I was planted? I'll try that, right? Which, I mean, it's good. And it, you know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. But uh, that's what I, what I, what I and, and this is what had drew me towards sociology, you know, mm-hmm. because I, I, I saw in sociology you know, this it very, very much an ecumenical thing, right? Because there's a, there, you're, there are Russians who are, who are doing it, attracted to it, Vladimir Slovyev, Bulgakov, Lorensky, Berjayev. But there were also um, Protestants who, who kind of started it off in modern times. Uh, Jakob Burma, the Philadelphian Society, and, uh, Thomas and Henry Vaughn, for sure. And then 
a little bit later, it hit the West in, in the Catholic West with Louis Boy, Boyer and Thomas Merton and, and people like this, right? So, so, so to me, it seemed, what I, what the appeal with that was not that it was um, fit material for some kind of esoteric construct, but that it was just very simple in, in, in having the idea that if, if, if we're in a, a right relationship with God and creation, we're, we're in a right relationship. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's what sociology is that that's enough for me. I don't yeah. need, I don't need all these elaborate systems and explanations and wheels within wheels to, to figure it out. You so the thing, sorry, sorry. Can you oh, I was that? just going to say, it was interesting that you mentioned the ecumenical piece because Bulgakov was particularly committed to those kind of ecumenical efforts um, when he was in, when he was in England, he tried to bring uh, his Anglican community that he was associated with um, in, in communion with the Orthodox Church. So he was deeply committed to that kind of vision. So I I think to me the the whole you could say that let's say the the, the hyper ecumenical part and I, it comes from I do see how it is related to sociology and that's one of the reasons why maybe I'm I am careful about so I tend to. If you listen to my talks, you'll notice I talk about the idea of the secret feminine, for example. Mm -hmm. Like I will use, I'm afraid of the explicitation of the mystery, let's say, of the feminine in the Christian Christian story. I'm very scared of that. And I feel like those that have gone too far in that, they tend to fall into a strange relativization, again, of of forms. And so- And they get 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 flaky. Right, and they yeah, get they're flaky. flaky in this, but they yeah. move like it's like I, I'll give you a, a, an example, very practical example. My own, my own brother went to a Trappist monastery to search for his own vocation. Spent a month there, and met with all these Thomas Merton like monks. And he said every single day he would speak to the, his his the supervisor there who would come to talk to him, the spiritual advisor. And all the guy would do was talk about Buddhism. Really. <laughs> that that's all he would talk about. He said, he, it's like, my, my own brother was like, well, what about Jesus? He's like, yeah, of course. He'd talk about Jesus for about two minutes and then he'd go right back to Buddhism. And it's like, <laughs> there, it's that, but there's something about that. When I notice, like I've seen with a lot of the non-dualists and, and I'm seeing that with like someone that I like, I admire David Bentley Hart very much so, but I'm seeing some of that in his, even in sometimes I see him almost have a disdain for Christianity and disdain for orthodoxy. Sometimes when he's speaking, it's like, it's trite, you know, let's talk about Shankara and let's talk about all these other non-dual systems. And I'm like, I don't know how helpful this is, especially yeah, in the in I, public, in a public discussion. And that's what actually, that's what bothers me about perennialism and, you know, and those kinds of traditionalisms, which is so, well, if everybody's right, <laughs> what am I doing this for? <laughs> Why am I looking? You know, but cause I don't buy it. Right. Cause I, you know, I figured for me, he's like, well, the incarnation, the crucifixion and the resurrection, that's about a, that's what I need right there. Mm. And I get it. Right. And that's, I'm sticking with that guy. Right. Mm. I'm going, that's the God I'm going to stick with. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, no, I, I, I of course totally agree with you. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and, and I, I think I, objectively it's, the story of Christ is un, unsurmounted. Like there's nothing yeah. that beats that, that, that beats that story. So it's like, it, it's, well, I would say that even the possibility of perennialism being a view that people hold is only because of Christ. Like, that's like, I don't think that there's no way in a pre-Christian era, you could have that as a thing that anyone would think. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think uh, paganism, a lot of paganism is actually pretty relativistic in that sense, you know? So the ancient pagans usually would, would, they had like in the back of their minds, a, a map, a cosmic map, and then they would map on to the different cultures that they would encounter. And so you can read in ancient Greek and Roman texts, like, you know, oh, they worship this God, they, those, they, yeah, Egypt, they would, this, right. They would map on yeah. their gods to the other gods. Map the Romans gods onto the German gods right. and so on. Yeah. yeah. And you see the same, like, I think Indian systems like Advaita, they tend to be quite they tend to be quite relativistic in terms of understanding that this kind of manifests itself everywhere. Like all, the pattern that they believe in is basically in every culture. Yeah. On the other hand, I think it is, I mean, not for everybody. I mean, it's not everybody's thing, but, but the study of comparative religion and what's beautiful in, in other religions is really a worthwhile activity. Right. Yeah. 
which is what I don't know about you, but that's basically what I was doing after from the age of 18 till about 28 or so, you know, so I was just checking it out. I mean, I like you, I never didn't feel like I was a Christian, mm. you know, never, not ever. You know? Yeah, I tend I tend to really see now like my uh-huh. approach to comparative religion is really a, a, a like well I guess I like like what what Nate was saying it really is Christ centered that is I tend to see everything through the lens of the incarnation mm-hmm. and then and then I'm able to look at at other traditions without feeling either overwhelmed or threatened or whatever yeah. I just see it as glimmers and 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 manifestations of the the incarnational principle um, and so. And so in that sense, I don't, I never feel like I'm in danger of being overwhelmed by all these other yeah. traditions. And I also, so I feel like I would never participate in like in other religious rituals. Uh, you know, I, I, I only participate in Christian, in the Christian tradition, but I can read a Sufi poem and find it beautiful and insightful and extremely connected yeah. to, to, to something which I see in the church fathers as well. Right. And it's interesting that, you know, in, in Topperg, Two things he says on this this topic. He says, uh, you know, while who came before me were beggars and thieves, right? Meaning all, all the religions that came before were beggars and thieves. And the other thing is, behold, I make all things new. So how how they, those different systems, we could say, and this is what I think Tom Burke's trying to do in, in his book, are, and this is what actually Hans von Balthasar said about Soloviev. Is that he, mm-hmm. that Sloviev took all these, you know, Gnostic systems and other things, and he ran them through Christ as in a as through a purifying stream, right? Mm. And I think that's part of what Tomberg's project is in that book is mm. to to clean it up, <laughs> you know. Yeah, which and is also what the, Christians and always also, do, right? And Christians and he, did that with Plato, did it with yeah. Plotinus, you know, and so and I think. And he's giving people of that esoteric bent a way back in. I remember when I read the book, I said, wow, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Because what my problem was before that is I thought I had a very limited perception and understanding of what Christianity is. Mm -hmm. And I read that book. I said, wow, maybe I didn't give this thing enough credit <laughs> the catholic church maybe i didn't give it enough credit maybe i didn't i could i was too busy seeing the version i got in the suburbs of detroit at, at a at a second rate catholic school <laughs> and not what's really there yeah but that's what actually one of my arguments for christianity really has been its integrative possibility because one of the things that i see also in that's what i call I, I don't know how to call it, like the esoteric split that happened, you know, at, at the Renaissance or after a bit after the yeah. Renaissance is that there re- you can see how things, how these these elaborate and very intellectual systems kind of move up. And then you can notice religion becoming more and more sentimental and moralistic and and less and less uh, understood, you could say. And so but I think that what Christianity ultimately offers is a way all it, it should be a way all the way through. So it's like when you stand in a church and you have this painted system of images right yeah. it, it it's as it's connected to a, a simple person could go in there and be completely touched and and impressed but then you know a metaphysician will walk in and see the map of the universe in yeah. the church so i think that that's one of the reasons why i that's one of the reasons why i i tend to 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 stay within let's say the more traditional mm. the, the, just talk about the church fathers as, as much as or saying i mean i would choose the church fathers right it's like it's 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 always the same saint ephraim saint gregory saint maximus so you know and they they seem to have had all those intuitions that that uh that are in the best of the esoteric systems let's say well and that that's and that's what i think you know another we, we were talking earlier about why people feel sometimes that the salt has lost its savor. And this is my own experience growing up. You know, I was kind of just naturally interested in mysticism. As I mean, I went to Catholic school and, you know, I wanted to know this person talked to, to Jesus or the Virgin Mary. What'd they say? What was it like? Mm-hmm. How did that, how does that happen? And, and nobody wanted to tell me, right? you know, cause, and I think, um, so what I got instead was, you know, the catechism or kind of a dry intellectual delivery. We had the Baltimore catechism. It was, I think that's turned more people off Christ, off the Catholic church than the sex scandal. <laughs> but, but, and, and 
And so it was for, for me, certainly, I mean, for, for a lot of people, it was an unincarnated experience of Christianity, which is, yeah. mm, which is ironic, right? Because, and how do, how do you return to that? And I actually, most of my life has been trying to find a way back into the, to that incarnated experience of Christianity. Mm. You know? Yeah. And I mean, I see all your, your, just your daily practices of being a farmer and doing that. I can see when I, when I kind of follow you and see what you're doing, I can notice that you're really trying to find that, that lived, let's say, incarnational principle. Yeah. So. And I don't, I don't want to read about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, cause I think what happened after that split you talked about in, at the Renaissance of the Reformation is at least in the West, not only did religion become more and more sentimental but the other half of it is became aridly intellectual. Yeah. You know, parts of it. I mean, not oh, the yeah. entire sure. thing, right? And, and so, and, and it was, in fact, I was reading in uh, Florensky, he was, he was talking about uh, the Russian tradition, which is what I love about it, is it's both intellectual and anti rational at the same time. You know, it's very intuitive or mystical while it's being intellectual, which is, you know, you see that probably in Slovia of more than in anybody, mm. you know, who's, who, who is the model for both Ivan and Aloysia in the brothers Karamazov. Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. That's it. Actually. It's, it's in a book written by his nephew that and he Ivan, mentioned that. that. Yeah. Because, uh, because Dostoevsky was good friends with Sloviev. Okay. Yeah. And he basically, Two, those two brothers on his two sides his, his that's hilarious whole, his side totally fighting, intellectual side, side yeah. and his and his deeply intuitive and warm side yeah that's really fascinating so what, what do you think about like let's say the basic perception that i have which is so l- let me give you let me give you a very practical example about what i'm talking about and so you know especially this is this is interesting because the the georgia guidestones were destroyed right just in a few weeks ago or whatever last week and so you know according to the the the, the legend the person who had it built was named christian rc and yeah, so, I saw that. so so you could say so, so like it, in a way it doesn't matter like whether or not this is related to any group that is actually considering themselves rosicrucian it there is something about the, the branding, there's something about the fact that normal Christians wouldn't refer to the Rosicrucians. But right now, something like weird, anti-human, uh, esoteric, like kind of occultist type thinking will attribute themselves to the Rosicrucians. Uh-huh. We could say like it's, it's too bad or whatever, but there's something about that, which I uh-huh. think is is important to understand in terms of this split that I talk about Absolutely. where, and, and the, let's say the accumulation of this esoteric tendency into, let's say Freemasonry groups or whatever, right. like trying to capture and Blavatsky was also, was also kind of trying to pull She's whatever she could thing, yeah. from all that stuff. And so this is, I think, so it's like, although I could, I can, for example, in Robert, someone like Robert Flood, I can see, let's say the power and the, the good intentions that are there and this desire to, to keep something magical and, 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 and wonderful about Christianity. It's like, by the time you get to Crowley, it's like, oh, yeah. and, and all these people are seeing themselves in line with that same, that same mm-hmm. type of thinking. I'm like, something's off. Like something really went Absolutely. off. Absolutely. And I need to, I need to not be too associated with whatever that is. No, you're right. And, and, and so my doctorate, I did my dissertation, um, one of the chapters is on, it's kind of, in fact, the title is The Rosicrucian Mysticism of Thomas and Henry Vaughan, mm-hmm. because they were part of that initial 17th century movement. But if you, and, and the, the original documents of the Rosicrucians were written by a Lutheran pastor. And if you read them, they're as straightforward uh, Christianity as you can get. You know, it's, they were, they were just interested in the, the rebuilding of society. And some people try to say that they wanted to rebuild society in a scientific way, which is not true at all. Um, oh, what's your name? Uh, Francis Yates wrote a book, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment. I think she, got, she totally misunderstood what was going on. It was actually, like I said earlier, a kind of a traditionalist movement that didn't want to lose that um, traditional Western Christian understanding of the relationship of the microcosm to the macrocosm about God's presence in the world, about the presence of not angels and demons in the world, right? 
yeah. is, is contributing to even weather patterns, right? Um, which was all thrown out the window with Rene Descartes. And, and they were, in fact, they, 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 they would rip on Descartes in their books. <laughs> they didn't like him at all. Yeah, but, so, isn't there a legend but how does Descartes, it get from there? Didn't Descartes write a public letter trying to be initiated into the room? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> So they turned him down. Weird. Good choice. Yeah, yeah I, good, I would have turned good. him down too. <laughs> I'm not answering that call. Yeah. But uh, but it was, it's funny because you read that, and so when I think of Rosicrucianism, I automatically think of that stuff. Yeah, which is, I mean, when you read it, you can't see how anybody could interpret it otherwise. But then you look at the Crowley stuff and the the Golden Dawn, and that came much later. And as we said earlier, this, these appropriations of the term, in fact, even the, the idea of the, the Rose Cross there, and I think it's a good argument that, that the, the Rose Cross comes from the coat of arms of Martin Luther, which had a, mm. a cross and a rose on it, yeah. you know? So who could be, some people think the RC means Roman Catholic. You know, there was a lot of discussion in the 17th century about whether this is actually the Jesuits trying to get Protestants to come back into the fold. <laughs> Yeah, because, the Jesuits. You know, it's always the Jesuits, right? Because well, they were smarter than everybody. But, but I so I mean, yeah. So how does it get from there to to what it became in the 19th century? It's just, or even the 18th century. Yeah. It's so strange. But I think so it's. Really I strange. think we have to. We really have to understand it as as this deincarnation. It's like we often think of something which becomes decadent as always going too low. But it it actually always starts with going too high. It's like there's pride. Pride is the first sin. And so there's something about trying, and you can see it like in the very rituals of the early uh, occultists and you know the the early magicians and the demonologists. There's something very p- powerful pride in that right. in the very idea of let's say weaponizing or capturing these spiritual entities and yeah. inquiring from them or using them for to to manifest their will. It's like that is some. That is definitely something which I think represents that pride, which we right. then, which does. Even though maybe it, it, you all do it for the good reasons at the beginning, right? It's like, you know, we're going to do this to help the world. We're going to, we're going to capture these demons in order to, in order to understand them and then exercise them from society. It's like that leads very quickly, in my opinion, to something. Absolutely. I agree. I totally agree. And I, and that's what I, I think, uh, well, like, like, in fact, in my dissertation, the first chapter is on John D, who was, pre- who was doing that precisely and who got played like a game of Yahtzee by the, by the spirit. <laughs> by these, he was, yeah. By these, yeah. By these oh, principalities that they worked played. him man. they, and he, and he, that thing is he was, he was a good man, I think. Yeah. You know, he was like, he's a guy who loved his family, loved his country, was, you know, doing it all the right stuff. But as you said, his problem was his pride. You know, I am the one who will bring this to the world. Yeah. And he thought that he was going to recover the language of Adam and that would heal all the divisions in Christendom. You know, <laughs> wrong. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And of course, the spirits talk him and, and his assistant to swapping their wives, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which That's is, you, I mean, you don't get any more mortal sin than that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't get better after that. Let's just do them all. Repent. Yeah, let's just get all this. Repent, it doesn't get better after that. It's like, but but I think. But on the other hand, you look at Henry Vaughn and his and his brother, and there's a. I mean, especially in Henry, there's such a beautiful, practical spirituality in his poetry that's both connected to nature and to God and to scripture. I mean, it's, I remember when I, when I, so doing a dissertation, you have to read everything the person wrote. So I was reading all, all this guy wrote and I'm and I read it and done. Oh yeah. This is basically what I am. This is what mm-hmm. I am. This is my spirituality right here, which is very simple. It's not complicated and it's not a cult in the least. It's very, but it's very mystical. I would say in, in a, in a practical mystical way, yeah, you know, yeah. just not, you know, not a, hopefully not a prideful one, but you know, what's important, God, his creation and community, right? The church, we can call it the community of the church. Huh. And that I think from, um, you know, if you focus on what's important, <laughs> then, then you, you know, then you protect yourself hopefully from, a little bit of evil. Yeah. 
Well, definitely. I think, I mean, I think that that's also, so I don't know if you've noticed, like there's an interesting moment right now. It's, it's just interesting because it seems like something got broken, I guess, in the past 10 years. I don't know how to say it. Something broke. And, and all of a sudden, secular atheists and secular people are now able to perceive principalities and they're able to understand at least what it is that we're even talking about when we use the word angel. So it's an interesting moment, uh, but it's also in some ways a very dangerous moment. And that's something oh, yeah. that I sometimes don't emphasize enough, especially with the psychedelics. A lot of people taking psychedelics and they, they indiscriminately encounter beings and then they're all excited about whatever it is that they encounter. Uh, and so I don't know if you've noticed that it seems like there's a we're at a at a like a a moment where magic seems to be seeping back into the world. Uh, but it, it's not all positive. Like it's a which is weird positive. because it, that's seeping in well, at the same time where well, where where everything's becoming disenchanted through the Internet. Right. Yeah. So there's this weird polarity going on. Right. But it seems to be like it's almost as if it's almost as if a natural movement of moving so far into darkness that all of a sudden, like, you know, these small lights start to be visible and people start to, to, to see. And also this also because, because we're noticing, I think one of the things that's doing it is actually the internet because the internet is based on attention and it's actually bringing to the fore the function of attention in the way the world lays itself out. And so it's like, there's not much more, there's not like, that's what magic is. Like magic is about that. And so if you understand that, and so, and now people have that experience where they're noticing how there's, everything is vying for their attention and that attention is actually creating bodies of, of interest and, and, and is actually kind of transforming reality. So I think that there's a strange, and because it's accelerated online, right? It's, it's usually these cycles of interest are long and they, they don't, they don't last like two days or one week or you know, sometimes mm-hmm. one day, you know, this idea of something trending, you know, and so I think that there's something about that which is making people notice something like vert- the vertical causality that Tomberg talks about. That is that that there's a relationship between, yeah, that there's a relationship between like common attention and then things manifesting themselves. I'd say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Egregore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah. That's what a lot of us are trying to like. Yeah. Talk about and try to help people differentiate the different the different, uh, but. I'm even even as I'm doing that, I'm worried because like I meet people that are like, all excited. They're like, like you talk about these angels, I want to meet them. It's like, what? No, no, that's not what <laughs> that's not why we're doing this. Like we're doing this so that people can see through, let's say, at least understand this this hierarchy of principality so they can see incarnationally. But it's not about like having yeah. it try to have encounters with angels. It's usually not the good angels. They don't they don't want to talk to you that way. It's, that's right. Yeah, I used to like, tell people way back in the day. My students would say, I'm going to, Mr. Martin, I'm going to use the Ouija board. I'm like, no, 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 no. Why? Because, because it's like d- dialing seven numbers and saying, can I talk to Jesus? Yeah. And the demon says, he thinks it's Jesus. That's yeah. right. Je- Jesus speaking. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're asking for trouble. <laughs> because they're smarter than you. And, they're, and they'll like with John D, they'll, they'll play you like a game of Yahtzee. They'll yeah, just exactly. mess. You know what I mean? They'll just ridicule you and it's one of them as tomberg actually talks about that how they just lead they lead people along yeah you're you're special <laughs> come on and we'll give you all this information which is all just be, be, ends up being gobbledygook right? yeah and you see it like you if you've known like i usually see it a lot in the people that i around me that are interested in kind of new age stuff and get sucked into that then they all have their weird guardian angels and their weird guides and stuff and it's usually never ends well like it just never doesn't go well never ever (laughs) oh man so nate so what is it that you want us to talk about besides the thing we talked about already (laughs) you guys seem to have no problem (laughs) is there are there things that you're curious about because i because 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 i also wanted this to be there's there's one there's a couple one one thing you said early on i just it's interesting the way Tomberg actually approaches the subject of reincarnation because he just says either you've experienced it or you haven't, and he doesn't argue. He doesn't. He doesn't argue it's for it. In fact, fact, he argues. Fact he can't argue for it. Right. Exactly. And he doesn't. And he and he doesn't make any argument for it being a meaningful part of a spiritual system of any kind. It's just kind of like, and then he and he drops it after that. Yeah, so the way he it, presents it is weird. So I'm wondering what you thought of that, and then. In letters, I don't know if you, I don't know if you got into letter six yet, but this idea of of 
of evolution being like on the horizontal plane under the guise of the serpent. That was very yeah. interesting to me because um, I can remember when I, I was raised Pentecostal and I can remember when I was going through my catechism, when I was converting to Catholicism, I still like had some misgivings about evolution. And I thought, and I, and I made this I argument to my priest <laughs> about how you really can't, if evolution is absolutely true without any qualification, there's no resolution to the problem of evil possible because you can't really, there's no way of dealing with the physical evil. Yeah. So I thought the way that Tom Burke talks about evolution as being this groping trial of the serpent offers a way to do that. I, I tend to, I t like the way that I, I, I presented before and the way I present it now is that I think natural selection is a, is a pattern in the world. It's a true pattern and it's a pattern that can help you understand things. But I think the narrative evolution is just useless and not yeah. interesting and, and it doesn't help you do anything. Like it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it has to be, it always ends up having to be represented mythologically, despite the scientists pretending that it's not. This and is kind it's of a what bad says too, though, because he says, he says it's a fact, right? So it's a fact on the horizontal plane. It's a fact, but it's a fact only, it's a fact only on the horizontal plane and that it's guide and that because it's on the horizontal plane, it's, it's origin is the serpent. But, you know, I, I think um, w part, you know, Tom Berg was a man of his, of his time. And that was the language that was a, the, the language of evolution, was, which was appropriated by Blavatsky. And the early Steiner also picked up on it. And they were speaking in these kinds of terms. Now it's spiritual evolution, right? Um, now, my friend Guido Preparata He's kind of he's a blunt and funny guy, and he thinks Darwin's whole project was was just a, a project to prove British imperialism. You know, it, it was social Darwin. You know what we call social Darwinism, right. Darwinism now. Yeah, that's what it is. See, the survival of the fittest. The British are the fittest. End of story. Right. Um, so I don't buy. I mean, personally, the I, I don't know what to think of the evolution narrative. I mean, I'm sure things do. I'm a farmer. I know how things work, but of course we, we have, we have a society that believes in evolution, but doesn't believe in gender. There's a fig. I can't figure it out. <laughs> well, you know, what's really yeah, well, interesting. It's, it's also the, the thing, the whole evolution narrative is the most, it's just so hilarious because the evolution narrative has to be, ends up being teleological. I mean, they can't avoid it. Every time they try to make it non -tele teleological, it failed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and so it always ends up having to be teleological. And so it, then it, then it becomes non-scientific immediately. It just right. becomes a kind of a mythological pattern. And yeah. it's like, well, if it's just mythological story, my mythological story is much better. Like the, the <laughs> creation narrative in Genesis uh, accounts way in a better manner for the ontological hierarchy of, of, the, of your experience of the world than the way that 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 evolution talks about reality and it's and you can see like i mean you know when i talked about weinstein it's always the same issue and you you see the same with all the evolutionary theorists they're basically saying what evolutionary want evolution really wants you to do is to basically kill and compete and take and right. and and just get your seed out there get your genes to the next generation but of course we shouldn't do that right it's like okay well where do you get the we shouldn't do that from yeah that's right. actually what interests me because that's that's a lot closer to what I care about. And then maybe you can find that in the Genesis story, but the other you can't find it anywhere else in your little yeah. pattern, like in yeah. your little worldview. Well, you know who believes in the evolution story? The World Economic Forum. Yeah. <laughs> and guess who's at the top of that food chain? Um, but, you know, it's interesting because you think about you mentioned Genesis. Genesis is the opposite of the evolution. It's the fall. Yeah. Right. It goes in the opposite direction. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and, and you're right, but you can you can understand, you can you can understand. It's it's so much closer to even to the way that evolutionists think of of their their tele teleological project because there is a hierarchy of being. If you read San Ephraim, it's it's beautiful. Like San Ephraim says that he says things like the animals did not come into the garden. And so the animals were, were would come to the foot of the garden, then Adam would come down the mountain. 
and he would like encounter them. And that's when he named them and everything. So there's this sense in which like the, the type of ontological hierarchy that they tried to create in their evolutionary system, it's, it's, it's there in the more traditional narrative and it's more, it's actually accounts for morality and responsibility and all this stuff that we actually think even now, even all these weird environmentalists, like super environmentalists, they're, they they believe in what Genesis says. Like they believe that we're the gardeners and we should take care of creation and that we shouldn't abuse it. It's like, if you're really like just an evolutionist, I, I don't know if you could really believe any of those things. I agree. Well, that's what, that's what happened with, and I think that's uh, explains Tom Berg's attraction for Teilhard de Chardin, right? Yeah. Because that's, that's evolution taken into Catholic theology. Yeah, I haven't right. gotten there. And so maybe I'll definitely have my, my beef with him when he gets to Teilhard de Chardin. I don't know yeah. yet. Well, I don't know if you read Teilhard. I mean, he, he's a beautiful writer. He really, he's a, he writes like a poet. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's beautiful writing. And he has a lot of brilliant insights, I think. Um, the, the complete project, I don't have to believe, agree with, with people about everything that they'd say. Yeah, you know of course, I mean? you're right. You're totally <laughs> to, to right. like them. I'm just, I'm just, I'm cool with the parts I like, you know? I don't have to, I don't have to be all in. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. That's how I approach pretty much everything. Like I don't, it's like, I don't have to defend everything that this person that I, yeah. you know, slightly I, I, associated with says. No, like, I don't agree with everything my wife says, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So well, what about some guy I never met, right? You're going to, you're going to tag me with everything he ever thought or believed. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Don't tell her that. <laughs> he says, don't tell her that. I, I'm sure she knows. I'm sure she knows. Yeah, she, oh, she knows. She says. Yeah, she uh, knows. And so, I mean, like, for me, I think that the ultimately, for me, the, the solution that I've been trying to, to propose has really been the, the taking the traditional forms that are there, taking the liturgical life that is that has all the potential. Like you said, like, even if it's lost, it's, like, if it's lost, it's salt. It's, like, it's there. It just has to be has to be kind of re recaptured and relived. And so to me, that seems like the only really realistic solution. And, 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 and in it. Yeah. Well, one of the things that Florensky mentioned in there, which, which kind of added savor to it was uh, those kinds of folk traditions. Yeah. You know, that, you know, are they really Christian? Are they kind of Christian? But yeah, let's keep those in there because those, th those, those make, christianity a way of life and not something you do on sunday right mm. and try to think you know i say a couple of prayers during the day but how do you incorporate that into a lived life right yeah and definitely because we people tend to think modern people tend to think more monastically it's like they think that you know living a more kind of embodied christian life would mean to just have you know do the hours or whatever do mm -hmm. more more services but i think you're right that there's a there's a more there's an even more embodied way, which is if you think of the Middle Ages and they had all these associations and clubs and people would, you know, be in the, the association of this saint and they would have their costumes and they would have all this yep. stuff and they would have, you know, like all these banners and processions and stuff. It's hard for us to even imagine it. But I know yeah. it's still with my friend Andrew Gould. I remember he said he went to this little village in Spain and and he said it was just astounding. Like they had these four hour, five hour processions of their statue of the of the mother of god you know all dressed up and and everybody had these like particular costumes and they would just kind of walk around and 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 every and he said it was so solemn and it lasted forever but everybody was just completely enthralled by these mm -hmm. processions and so yeah it's just hard because we don't in north america we're it too feels, busy yeah. it always feels like we're immediate, but it's all always feels like we lost like a, so much of it that to bring it back is almost idiosyncratic you know yeah i mean and i say that for the orthodox very much it's like it's like people become orthodox and they think they'll immediately become russian or it's like that's not going to happen right <laughs> you have to find some kind of discussion about how to embody folk folk traditions right so let's say on for us on if on theophany like we'll still do like the fr traditional french epiphany uh celebration right we have a cake and we put a bacon bean, bean in it yeah and, we do it too. and we have like the king of the day and stuff and so like this is not orthodox but it's it's like these are the traditions but, that we have we but need it's to, french canadian yeah yeah it's definitely french canadian that's for yeah sure. yeah we do it we too, need to I like think. find ways to connect all this in a way that is that is, it's going to be messy and organic but it was so already 
in the folk Isn't that kind of already the norm for but, orthodoxy, though? It's a kind of like morph uh, itself somewhat to the culture that that it's expressed in. It should, hopefully. Well, but uh, the Greeks Henry, have a lot of, you know. Yeah. The other thing that, that, <laughs> that like, like the, the bean cake and, you know, all that stuff. Um, th- th- I also think that that's a way to, to have children. This is a way to raise children in a lived experience of Christianity, yeah. you know, cause they, they can, they're not gonna, you know, we all remember being in church as, as little kids listening to a sermon. I mean, not listening to a sermon yeah. and wondering how long is this going to take? Right. But the, those, those festivals of conviviality, make it for for children and for for growing people too uh a lived experience and then when people have children they want they want that they you can people hunger for that yeah they want an experience of of the world that is that is not only spiritually nourishing but that's nourishes their their souls and their relationship with other people because you can do it by yourself right there's something different when you do it in a community yeah. Which is what a like, church is supposed to be. And I think, so I think that's why, I mean, I've noticed a lot of uh, these Orthodox churches take it seriously is to realize how the coffee hour in terms of, in terms of a, a modern church is absolutely essential. Like you actually, you really need to have one or two hours after liturgy or after a service for people to be together because we're not in a village anymore. You don't just walk right. out and then go back to your house. And then it's your neighbor that was there in church with you. Right. So we have to create these spaces where we, we can have, you know, a more informal communion or else it's just going to, it's not going to, it's not going to, it's not going to go. Otherwise it's like punching a clock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Going to the G, go communion, yeah. go back home. Okay. <laughs> Bad coffee is important. Check. <laughs> But we've really noticed, like we've noticed that at least in my parish, it's been a, it's been a, one of the, because we are seeing our parish grow quite a bit in the last year. I think a lot of, a lot of parishes are growing because of post COVID people looking for meaning and stuff. Yeah. Um, and we've noticed that that's been one of the keys has been to have like a, a place and a time afterwards for people to, to sit down and to connect. And so then it encourages them to, to call each other during the week and to, to connect in, in, a, in, in other informal ways. So. Yeah, so you're right. So we need these more embodied, more embodied practices. Yeah, because liturgy is wonderful, but it's it's not. It has to kind of seep into all of reality. It can't just yeah. be. Yeah, it's got to be everywhere. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Yeah. So I mean, how does that play into? I know, I know, Michael, you've expressed some disappointment with the way that the church handled COVID. I have. And how and, and, and <laughs> I mean it seems to me that what you guys are talking about right now and the way yeah. the church the church is kind of handled COVID, they're not I think I honestly think, like seriously think that COVID was a litmus test for a lot of churches. And I I think that a lot of the churches that that didn't that weren't attentive to what was happening and didn't take into account the 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 primacy of communion, I think there a lot of them won't get over this. Yep, I think I, so. I really believe that they just won't survive. And I think the opposite is also true. The churches that 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 you know were it's, a lot of them were cautious at the outset, like we're you know obviously, and yeah, but then slowly sure. started to realize that okay, wait a minute, there's something else going on, and then mm-hmm. started to to emphasize communion over being strict on the rules and everything. I think those will thrive, and they have thrived. Oh. Well, yeah, when and I just it was so for me it was so profoundly discouraging to see so many, especially in the Catholic church, when, when the Pope um, required all employees of the Vatican to have the vaccination, like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And that now they backed off. They never apologize when they back off. It's like, Oh yeah, well, we were, you know, it just, it's, it becomes uh, they're slaves to policy. And, and, and if you probably saw too, there were many churches out across North America and Australia places who, would have signs saying fully vaccinated parishioners may come to confession <laughs> or to communion. Right. Can you imagine that. I Can mean, we imagine? had the, like we, cause you, I don't know if you know what happened here in Quebec. Like it was crazy because oh, yeah, yeah. so we, we had the church were closed for the longest time. Right. And then yeah. finally they were open with limited people, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And all this stuff. Right. But then came the moment when they were going to, they were going to impose the COVID vaccine passport on the churches. That was to me, that was, I think, was mm. the litmus test. And those churches that 
try to find solutions to that and not, imp not impose it. Because the US, you, you would have to have a parishioner standing at the door with their phone, scanning people as they walked into the church. Can you imagine no. how crazy that is? That's, and so yeah. it's like, I think that- you know, The doors, churches, the doors, right? Let us see it. That's what that was for, right? When they say the doors, the doors, it was to keep the, you know, the spies out. <laughs> Look at the spies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they, they'll come in here and kill us after we say the creed. Yeah, exactly. And so, so I think that I've seen like the church, some churches did crazy stuff. Like they had, they, it was minus 30, right? It was like right in the, it was like in December, in January. Yeah. And so some churches just had services outside, you know, people found ways to, to get around it or whatever. Um, but I think the church is that applied it. That is not a lot of hope for those guys. I'm sorry to say, oh, wow. I mean, maybe they'll survive. Like, but I don't think, I think it's going to be a serious, they're, they're going to have to do it with a lot of like repentance and, and return to, and, uh, and deliberate desire to, 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 to re-enter communion because. Yeah. Well, and I think we'll also see uh, a kind of church of the catacombs. Yeah, for sure. You know, under kind of a, guerrilla church or underground church or something yeah. you know yeah and people love to learn to do like we 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 started to learn to do this the the reader services you know because it's like if if, if we if we depend on the clergy completely yeah. then we're 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 going to be in trouble it's that, that, that was i was up i don't know how well, you, you brought are. up solo vio several times uh michael and i can't help but think of tale of the antichrist it's not the it's the majority of the church goes along yeah with the antichrist, with the antichrist yeah. in, in that story it's just yeah. like the three figures that he has representing the you know the protestant the cat the, the catholic and the orthodox tradition they're the ones with the courage to stand up but mm -hmm. those major the vast majority of the clergy in in all three oh, yeah. go along yep they join the antichrist so. well it's not hard to it's not hard to see it now like it's see, no. it, there's there's something wonderful about the moment right now, which is that there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of, let's say, apocalyptic thinking that I didn't totally understand, let's say, 20 years ago. And I'm not saying that this is it, like this is the end of the world or whatever. Right, right. But I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of structure that I can now see. And not only do I understand them, but I can see them burgeoning I can kind of see them. <clears throat> Uh, popping up in the world and it's like okay i understand yeah. what this is talking about well it's a revelation right? yeah in apocalypse definitely. in that sense it's it's taking it's tearing the veil open yeah so you can oh, see what's going and on i mean also I like the idea of antichrist itself like the idea of something which is a parasite on christian morality but manifests itself so it's like right the idea for example that we saw like the, the weaponizing of compassion that we saw during the the covid time it's like that was like a weird parasite on christianity yeah, so you can kind of see it's like okay i can kind of i mean I, i'm not saying this is antichrist but i can kind of see the pattern of antichrist how it can manifest itself and how it can also delude people how can how, can, how it can trick people into believing this is true christianity and tricking is the right word right yeah. And you can yeah. see like it's you can see like with even with like the you can see, who would have thought that. So, for example, like it's like, like in the abortion debate. I'm sorry to become political here, but like who would have thought that there would be a common moment when someone would be able to say out loud publicly a Christian should be pro abortion. It is the Christian position to yeah. have. Like, this I is know. the compassionate Christian position to have to be pro abortion. It's like and you see now people take that position all the time. It's yeah. like, really? It's like who would have thought? But then you can see it. It's a, it is a weaponizing of compassion and the, and yeah. and, I, and and a weaponizing of the idea that we're in the image of God. Like all of these Christian ideas are being twisted and 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 contorted to to bring about these strange positions. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, I'm depressed now. That's right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. No, but Michael, I'm not we have to, but I think like I think like I I'm a, I'm a 50-50 all the time. Like this is why I think I how I survive. Like, I'm 50-50 all the time because on the one hand, I can kind of see that I can I, I like all of a sudden I see these patterns of that are straight up from the book of Revelation kind of mm -hmm. come come towards me. And at the same time, I'm also seeing the 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 candle like uh, being lit. I can see like the next. I don't know what to say. Like I can get a glimmer of the resurrection. This maybe is another yeah. way to say it. I can mm. see it. Like I can actually see it and I can notice, you know, I had this talk with someone like, 
Ian McGilchrist that I, I think I put up today. Yeah, I had a talk yeah. with Don, Don Hoffman, all these like cognitive science type people that are total secularists, or even my discussion with John Ravaki. It's like uh, John Ravaki and 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 then we're using the word angel and demon as if this was a totally normal technical word to use to talk about transpersonal beings. And I was like, I can't believe that we're that we've reached this point where a scientist would use that word and not flinch or not feel embarrassed at all about using it so i think so i think we're we're going to be surprised like there's going to be some wonderful surprises and some yeah. dark surprises at the same time <laughs> well i think so too and that's you know and i kind of saw it coming and wrote about it mm. you know because i think you know like you're saying uh, the, the, we had the rise of the technocracy or the archons if you want to call them that yeah but you know there is also you know the real possibility to uh, to live the kingdom. You know that the kingdom of heaven is within you. You know, so there's there's a there's a capacity to realize that. And I think, and if you go back to the early Christians, there were there were those there were parallel societies there too, parallel polices, yeah. right? There was there was the power structure, and there was the kingdom. And I don't think we've we've had uh, uh, an, enough awareness of the kingdom for the past couple of few generations, mm. you know. And and I think part of what I think happened if you read uh, World War II or post World War II literature, when all the intellectuals were like, "What the heck just what happened?" happened? <laughs> you know what I mean? They're they're soul searching. And I think that really destroyed a lot of people as far as, as religion goes, not just Christianity, you know, mm -hmm. that the Holocaust could happen and you could have that much evil and God didn't intervene. Right. And I think we, we have it at a different, um, ma different manifestation of that kind of evil right now. Um, but maybe in a way, this is our opportunity to not despair as happened to those people in the 1940s and 50s. Right, yeah. or they despaired, and it's and it's really easy to despair. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, right now. from listening but, to my from listening to my wife, I would say that like the the Jewish experience in that post Holocaust is almost like the opposite, though. Like there was a lot of like a lot of Jews who weren't really even religious. Like they returned to Judaism, not even out of any real religious commitment, but just out of the idea that there should be more Jews in the world, because like both her parents like were <clears throat> basically atheists. Um, but they made sure that their children were were raised with the knowledge of their faith and mm. and practiced anyway. So yeah, I mean, I think for sure, like the the rise of of the the, the Hasidim is is based like in part in like the yeah. World War II and and like the 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 return of kind of Orthodox Judaism or the strength of Orthodox Judaism does I does seem to be. But I think it it's not like I think what it's 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 the two extremes you could say because mm -hmm. also. I mean, the 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 secular Jew is 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 extremely powerful in the world right now as well. Like you have right. a lot of that, a lot yeah. of that very strong. So I think I think what we're probably going to see something similar in the Christian Church. We're going to see a kind of remnant which will which will consolidate and become, you know, deliberate and authentic. And at the same time, we're going to see the world in general become more and more anti anti Christian and and uh, and secular. So right. I think so. I mean, especially as the churches, like here in Quebec, like the churches are, at some point, they're going to start to demolish the churches. Like they have to, because they're trying to, pass, they're trying to, to send these things out. Like they're trying to sell them, but it's like all these old buildings, no one wants to keep up. And so at some point, we're going to start to see bulldozers like go into these things. Mm -hmm. it's, going to, it's going to be inevitable. We see it in Europe happening now all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I think that that'll have that'll be important. Like, I think it's, it's probably good that that happens because it's going to help people see what's going on in, in ways that might both increase the secularism, but also shock yeah. some people into thinking, okay, so what, what is it then? It's like, is it more shopping malls? Is that what we really need? Or you know, is it a, <laughs> a taller cell towers? Is that, is that going to yeah. be like our, is that going to be our, our, our holy place? Is it going to be really, really tall cell towers? But right. Yeah. Let's see. <sighs> Sorry, Michael. I feel like I'm really not. Oh no, no, no! You're not bumming me out. No, no, no. I I agree. You know, I'm just, just. You know, I. I mean, in fact, you know, oh my gosh, my whole project is pretty, 
<laughs> it's a pretty hopeful project, right? But mm. but knowing you're up against this this kind of darkness, yeah. Mm. And which is and what what surprised me over the last couple of years is how effective the mass formation and, and uh, propaganda project of the bad guys has been. I mean, you got to tip your hat. It was well orchestrated. Yep. That you could, but but and. It's a bit, it's 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 amazing. Like here in Canada, it's amazing. Like it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, Justin, Justin, you know, is just obviously a, like a empty like puppet. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. Like it just doesn't matter. It all it all works. Like it all. And just, it's, the whole world is like that right now. The whole West. Well, it's amazing you know? how many sophisticated people show for it. I mean, they just fall for it, though. I mean, it's 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 really it's mind boggling. Yeah. I mean, it but kind it, of like it, 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 it kind of proves the rules idea that elites are more prone to propaganda. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, well, no, propaganda is never aimed at you know people with a high school education. They always aim right. propaganda at the middle managers, the teachers, yeah. professors, and yeah. doctors, and people like that who think they're smart. You're smart because you believe, yes, I'm smart, and I'm doing this to help others. So you're saying it's designed specifically for dumb, smart people. Yes. The midwits, it's the, yeah. midwits. Yeah. the midwits. They're the problem. They're always the problem. The midwits. <laughs> yeah. Uh, gosh. Wow. Well, it was really great getting to listen to you guys talk. I'm glad. I, I'm glad <laughs> I brought you to together. have this conversation. Yeah. So you got me to be quiet for the most part, which is not an easy task. <laughs> it was our plan. We talked ahead of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Excellent collusion then. Okay. All right. Oh, well, well, thanks for the yeah. conversation. This was, this yeah, was thanks for thanks for joining great. me today. I really appreciate the yep. gift of your time, both of you. All right, appreciate Thank this. You guys. I'll, I'll I'll let you know when I get it posted. All right, all right, great, go. wonderful. All right. Yep, Thank take you. care. As you know, the symbolic world is not just a bunch of videos on YouTube. We are also a podcast, which you can find on your uh, usual podcast platform. But we also have a website with a blog and several very interesting articles by very intelligent people that have been thinking about symbolism on all kinds of subjects. We also have a Clips channel, a Facebook group. You know, there's a whole lot of ways that you can get more involved in the exploration and the discussion of symbolism. Don't forget that my brother Mathieu wrote a book called The Language of Creation, which is a very powerful synthesis of a lot of the ideas that explore. And so please uh, go ahead and explore this world. You can also participate by you know, buying things that I've designed, t-shirts with different designs on them. And you can also support this podcast and these videos through PayPal or through Patreon. Everybody who supports me has access to an extra video a month. And there are also all kinds of other goodies and tiers that you can get involved with. So everybody, thank you again. And uh, thank you for your support.